very much for joining us. First of all, congratulations on the game this evening. Great win for you. Well, we, we are the holders of the Middlesex Senior Cup and um, uh, it was a tough draw because Enfield are a good side and really foul conditions as I'm sure your pictures will show. But we played well, we're pleased and we're on a decent run at the moment. And, it makes it all worthwhile when you, you know, you see the faces, uh, the smiling faces of the players when they come in. They work really hard for us tonight. Oh. Well, that's where I started. Um, my team, uh, Woking, who are in the National League. Uh, I went there when I was eight years old, and they've always been a non-league team. They got close to getting into football either, but never managed it. Um, so I started as a, as a non-league fan. And then I played non-league football, I got into the same league, I actually played against Woking, which was a bit of a strange experience for a Woking supporter. Um, uh, and uh, I played for five, six years at that level. Um, so, although I've been in my commentary career, obviously you want to be commentating on the, on the top games, there's always been room in my life and in my heart for football at this level. And um, about 12 years ago, just over 12 years ago, Alan Dowson, who I was coaching a, um, a youth team with, um, asked me, he just got the, he was a player at Walton and Hersham, former football league player, played for Millwall and Bradford City, had a spell and loan at Fulham as well, so he, he had a professional career. Um, but he got a job as a player manager at Walton and Hersham and he was a bit short-handed. When he asked me to come and join him, I thought he meant as the press officer. <laughs> so <laughs> I said, look, I think I've got enough media work on my plate, really. And he went, no, no, come and, come and coach. And I'd coached youngsters before, but never senior players. So it was in at the deep end. First session I'll never forget um, because they tried it on with me. And, uh, uh, but I survived and here we are all these years later and we've been at three, as you say, three different clubs. And this is the highest level we've got to. We, we won the, what was the Ryman League then, a couple of years ago. And uh, we got into the playoffs to get into the National League, national, uh, last year. But we got knocked out in the semi-final by Ebbsfleet. So, um, it, it's, it's quite serious actually, <laughs> the level, uh, and of course I, I come across a lot of people that I've commentated on and managers that I've commentated on when they were players, so it is separate from work, but it's also joined up as well. Well, that's, that's a very good question. Um, uh, commentating is my responsibility in the team that is the television team. So I'm in control of what I do. Maybe you might not think that all the time, but uh, obviously if I fail, it's my, my, my mistakes. And, and I do make mistakes, I promise you. Uh, but it's, it's an individual thing, whereas being in the dugout with a team, it is, you're in, you're in that position where you, you win together or lose together, there is a result together. Um, and I think that the, the difference is, of course, that you can't control what happens in the match. You can do your bit from the bench. The manager allows me to obviously chip in with ideas for substitutions. And we didn't make one tonight, actually. <laughs> we didn't make a change. Um, but we do, um, we obviously do talk a lot like that. So um, it's more of a group thing. And winning and losing it, as a television broadcaster, you can never do a perfect commentary. So you come away, and I promise you this, um, and I really mean it, it sounds a bit pious if I say it, about three times a season, I'm happy with a commentary. No more than that, because I know what I could have said, maybe what I should have said, what I didn't say when I, you know, when I had the chance to say it. Um, if you win a football match, it's, it's sort of, you can get a bit of perfection out of that because you're in it to win it. So, um, the feelings are quite different in some ways, but my job is a commentator. I mean, that, that's what I'm qualified to do. I'm helping out in non-league football, and I'm, when I, I really did start as the oily rag, I'm not much more than that now, but to be thinking that I'm in the National League South with a really good club, a really good bunch of players, and we've helped players to go into the Football League as well. Jamal Lowe and Nicky Kabamba helped us win the, the Ryman League, as it was called then, and they, they went to Portsmouth, and they were with our blessing, and we got some money for them, but, but we wanted them to progress. And that's part of the fun as well, to see the lads 
go forward and, and, and I will say well I'll end up commentating on you one day and, and that's special for me it hasn't happened yet with Jamal who's in the Portsmouth team every week but I'm sure it will so did you ever find yourself sat on the bench commentating your own game to yourself <laughs> no I, I, I probably shout at them and hear, hear the players who are going to tell you that, that, that what I say is not the truth but no I'm, I'm the quiet one on the bench and uh, I leave the, the talking to the to the gantry when I commentate. Well, they take they're taking what um, what they should be taking. They're taking the best players. Um, Jamie Vardy is probably the first one that comes to mind, um, but there are others who have come through the non-league scene, and, and that happened before the Premier League. I commentate with Alan Smith, the former Arsenal striker. He was a non-league player with uh, Alva Church before he went to Leicester City, his first um, professional club. And I also, of course, get to discuss non-league football with uh, a certain Gary Neville, who is very involved with taking Salford City out of non-league. That's his uh, his stated wish. And who knows? Maybe um, maybe in Gary's time they'll they'll get in the Premier League. <laughs> He's full of ambition. But um, I know the question's more serious than that. I, I think non-league has to stand on its own feet. You know, we we have a budget at, at Hampton and Richmond, and, and every non-league club has their budget to work within and, and uh, we don't want hand-me-downs to be honest and we want to make it work for us for our supporters for our communities and what I love about non-league football is there is a non-league club just down the road from all of you anyone watching this if you're watching it in a non non-league scene and you don't know quite what we're talking about um, those clubs are there up and down the country my son actually made a film called King's Meadow which featured Alan Dowson the manager um, and, uh, and he was enchanted by the non-league uh, accessibility the accessibility of the clubs and when you have a club the accessibility of the players our players have just walked past here and they're going to the bar and they'll meet our fans not that we had too many here tonight in the pouring rain but some did come and they're, and they're all in it together and, and that's a lovely thing and of course you can't expect the Premier League to be like that um, you know, it, it, it is a little bit more distant because you know, there are so many more supporters uh, and the players have lives to lead away from the spotlight. They, they want to get away from the spotlight. Our lads enjoy being in the spotlight, to be honest. Uh, and, and they deserve to be because um, they're, they're a good group. What I want to see is the clubs being self-sufficient, the clubs being solvent um, and that happens in different ways, obviously. There are benefactors, they're not the, the Abramoviches of non-league football, but there are people who put their hands in their pockets up and down the country to help the local community club, the directors, the chairman, and all sorts of uh, sponsors who, who chip in for us. So we're very grateful to that. And if a club can manage by that route, then that's fine. But if they can't, then obviously what's happened with the supportive trust has been brilliant because it's saved clubs from extinction. Um, these are clubs with really rich histories. I mean, you know how old I am. And, I, and I've been around this non-league scene in one capacity or another for almost all my life. And so I know the histories of, of the of Enfield, the old Enfield. I played against the old Enfield. The ground that's down the, was down the road from here. And a very good team they were. They got to the Amateur Cup final in the late 1960s, I think. Um, and they were... Um, you know, they, they, they were very well supported in those days. Now, maybe they don't quite get the gates that they used to. Uh, my last um, well, Isthmian League, as it was called, then was away at Wickham Wanderers, and I, I think there were like 4,000 people. That was my last appearance in that, in that league playing for Corinthian Casuals um, over 40 years ago. But the, 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 the crowds were, I think, more able to make the clubs pay. Um, and of course what we've had in my time as well is the switch from being amateur-ish, <laughs> but officially amateur, into, into the professional world. So players get paid, they should get paid, they give up a lot, we ask a lot of them, um, and money has to be found. And if it can't be found by what you might call the previously conventional methods, then the supporters' trusts are, are brilliant. And any fans that buy into it uh, have my total admiration because I'm not sure if I was just a supporter of working as I, I could have been without, without having any inv uh, involvement in football or the media, I'm not sure I would have been able to, to, to give that kind of financial support. And I, I think it's, it's amazing what you do. Um, and, and any club that 
that needs um, a cushion, really, or a soft landing, you've been helping provide one. It's a good question again, a really searching question. Um, there are measures in place and obviously there are questions asked about those measures because some clubs have fallen foul of clearly not having the right people involved. The vast majority of people who run football clubs are the right people, but protecting from those who could spoil it, who could um, asset strip, and that's been going on a long time because a lot of these wonderful non-league clubs are on very prime sites and maintaining the, um, the, the football club in the community. Obviously sometimes you can sell your ground and move somewhere else but the councils have helped that in, in certain clubs up and down the country. Um, I think things should be more transparent, that's what I would say. I cannot understand why we're asking now, uh, even at the highest level, for more transparency. Why should anybody have anything to hide? I mean, the industry, I'm close to it, but I, I'm not so close that I know what's going on. And I think as a member of the media, I should be able to know how much a player is bought and sold for an undisclosed fee. Why undisclosed? What, what, is, what are people hiding? Yeah, of course there might be reasons why they, they might have some criticism. They might have bought a player for 20 million and sold him for two and it's undisclosed, the two, and the fans will go, hang on a minute, you've just put 18 million down the river. But um, yeah, people understand that, you know? Sometimes we buy a car and we have to sell it, it breaks down, you know? Things aren't perfect in this world. So that's, I, that, to answer your question simply, I think more transparency within the football industry. Um, we at Hampton, we've got nothing to hide. Uh, you know, people can come and look at, uh, at all, now we're in the National League, it all has to go through. They're very good, and I, as I've found out in the last two years, um, they know how much money our players are paid, they, they, they know all the deals that we have, they know our budget, and all that information on the other clubs is available to our chairman and, and directors as well. So uh, that's, that's what... I, I, we're, we're, we're round the corner here, but you know things shouldn't be kept round corners in football. They they should be open, and I think the supporters deserve to know what's going on. Um, and if you don't really know, you will be suspicious. It's our nature to be suspicious, um, and I don't think there's probably as much to be suspicious about as perhaps we think. But there are things that we we should know, and I'm talking within football as well as as a, a member of the media. Thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, and thank you very much for giving your time. No, that's not good. Thank you. You've come a long way for this in <laughs> pouring rain as well. <laughs>